Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 12th Financial Markets and Corporate Governance Conference hosted by the Monash Business School at Monash University. I'm Phil Gargori, who, along with Hugh Dong, are the co-chairs of this conference. So it's coming up to 9am here in Melbourne, in Australia, on a chilly Melbourne morning. So we have a packed program for you, highlighted by six plenary sessions at this conference. So we're going to start off today with a keynote by Wei Xiang from Columbia. And later today, we have a panel session on environmental finance. Tomorrow, we have a keynote by Ronnie McKayley from the University of Hong Kong and a panel session on digital finance. And on the last day of the conference, we have a keynote by Lu Zhang from Ohio State and a panel session on superannuation funds. For those of you internationally, you regularly refer to them as pension funds. So in addition to the plenary sessions, we have more than 300 papers in the concurrent sessions for both the main conference and the PhD symposium. And to give you all a sense of the international nature of the conference, we have 90 paper presentations by North American academics, 78 paper presentations from European academics, 74 here from Australasia and 67 from Asia. So I hope you find the conference rewarding and educational and that you enjoy the conference. It's my pleasure now to hand over to Professor Sharman Hartel, who's the Associate Dean Research Impact at the Monash Business School to officially open the conference. Thank you, Philip. And welcome everyone. On behalf of the Monash Business School, I extend a warm welcome to the 12th Financial Markets and Corporate Governance Conference. And I acknowledge with our geographically dispersed audience, the First Nations peoples across whose many lands we are gathered today, paying respects to their elders past and present. The COVID-19 pandemic has posed a number of challenges for both corporate governance and financial markets. Many companies have seen their customer bases disappear while they grapple with new work practices associated with people working from home. At the same time, we have experienced increasing volatility in financial markets. Many of the corporate governance decisions that companies are facing have implications for investors, such as whether to pay dividends when people are losing their jobs and the future is so uncertain. This conference will bring together participants from around the world to consider these issues and others. I am sure you will gain new insights and understandings of the challenges facing businesses and markets, and that the conference will give rise to new ideas that can form the basis of new and interesting research on related topics. I congratulate Hua Duong and Philip Gargori, as well as all of the organizing committee for putting together such a fine program. Again, welcome and enjoy your conference. Thank you, Shaman. So I'll pass over to Alvira Socially now, who's gonna be chairing Way's keynote. Thank you, Alvira, for agreeing to do this. Alvira's at the University of New South Wales. Good morning, everyone. Yes, as Philip said, I'm Alvira Soili. I'm at the University of New South Wales, but I'm also the president of the Financial Research Network here in Australia. I am delighted to host Wei's wonderful keynote. She is very appropriate to be the starting speaker of this conference, given all her leading work in corporate governance. But for those of you that haven't had a chance to come across Wei's work, Wei is Professor of Finance. She is a Chair Professor of Arthur Burns at the Finance Division at Columbia Business School. But she's also at the Columbia Law School, the Scholar in Residence, and also works at the Corporate Governance Program at Harvard Law School. And of course, she's a research associate at the MBR. So Professor Jiang is a leading scholar in corporate governance, and she has pioneered research in hedge fund activism, which I personally found very inspiring. She has published extensively in top econ, finance, and law journals. And obviously, she has also been heavily featured in many media uh, outlets. Furthermore, Professor Jiang is an associate editor of the Journal of Finance, and she has been at the editorial board of the Review of Financial Studies. Previously, she was also the finance department editor at Management Science. So she has extensive experience in the field of corporate governance, and today she's going to give a keynote on and around this issue. So way welcome, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts around corporate governance and hedge fund activism. 
Thank you all. Thank you for the uh, for putting together this wonderful program. Um, it's my utter pleasure uh, to be featured uh, in this uh, in this conference, especially on a topic that's very very dear to my heart. Uh, so let me share my uh, screen. Looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so today I'm actually going to talk about how we would think about the intersection between the traditional topic of corporate governance and a much newer topic of data and the technology and how such intersection should compel us to rethink about the board centric model that we have been um, very familiar with. So when people talk about corporate governance, what should come to your mind? Now, the formal definition uh, is pretty broad. So corporate governance is nothing but a set of processes policies, regulations, institutions, all the way to laws that should affect and direct the way a corporation is managed, administered, and controlled. Now, we think about the fundamental sources that make corporate governance uh, interesting and also challenging in this conflict interest due to separation of ownership and control, as well as the information asymmetry that usually arise between the insiders and outside investors. Now, because of this conflict of interest and because of this information asymmetry, now the modern corporate governance, uh, corporate governance system, uh, especially in the US and UK, as well as in, in, in most major economies, is to put the board to be between corporation, its management, and its shareholders. Now, shareholders own the corporations, but they really don't make critical or day-to-day -day decisions, so they delegate the job to the corporate board of directors. Of course, there are other gatekeepers, there are media watchdogs, there are other stakeholders, there are creditors, there are regulators, but by and large, board of directors are making the most important oversight and decisions on behalf of the shareholders. Now, where does technology fit? Now here, let's think about why do we have a board-based governance system? Now I would characterize as three pillars. One is the source of information. Now here we have a board. Now where does a board directors obtain the information? Of course, they read newspapers, you know, they talk to their friends, but by and large, their information is mostly fed by the management. So you can consider it a, a transmission of information in a censored way. Now, the second uh, important role they play is the board of directors are expected to represent the aggregate shareholder preferences. Now, the fiduciary duties are such that regardless whom they were appointed to the board, so sometimes they, they were appointed on the board by a big shareholder, et cetera, but once they're on the board, they have to represent the preferences of all shareholders. And we somehow trust that the board members are in the best position to aggregate such preferences. Now, the third pillar is that it's a decision making by the board and the decision made by the board is if, um, then um, afterwards will be executed by the management team. Now, today I will say that technology readily uh, changes all three premises because the information, more and more of it, is no longer just controlled by the management and sometimes not even generated by the management. More and more information is currently generated outside the firm. So that would challenge the model that the board will somehow make decisions with information that's mostly fed by the management. Now, second, how do we know what shareholders want? In the past, we somehow delegate that the board member to the board member that they're supposed to aggregate the shareholder preferences. Now we have distributed ledgers. You probably are more familiar with the distributed ledgers to be facilitated payments or transactions. But when you think about the same technology could also be used to aggregate shareholder preferences and you will find the ready uh, analogy between a payment and a vote. Now, finally, what is, it, what is the mechanism between decision-making and execution? Now, we've put the humans of human, uh, the human directors are there, but people these days say, hey, now we have smart contracts. 
can we have autopilot in boards? No, my answer will be yes and no. And I will provide, uh, provide more um, uh, arguments as well as evidence along all these issues. Okay, so let me start with the new paradigm of information asymmetry. Now, all our older textbooks I read as a graduate student in economics from University of Chicago, uh, all these governance issues were invariably related to information asymmetry. And then among information asymmetry, the leading asymmetry was analyzed in the classic paper by Myers and Modulov. So we always said the Myers and Modulov 1984 paradigm was still dominates the corporate governance research all the way to today. Now, all this paradigm could be summarized in one sentence, which says, when firms have information that investors do not have. Now, we kind of think, yes, probably firm in management has more information than investors, but it does not mean that investor information is a subset of firms. Now, early on, I had worked with my longtime co-authors, Itai Ghosting, Alex Admons and Chi Chen. So we had you know, at least two papers. And we suggest that firm managers learn from stock prices in decision making. So they learn from the stock market about something they did not already know. In presenting the two papers, we were constantly challenged. People would say, have you read Myers and Modulo? How can the outsiders know, know more than the insiders? So that was a main challenge when we tried to uh, present those papers and eventually publish those two papers. But I would think today we have a much stronger case to argue that outsiders oftentimes do have information that could be incremental to the insiders. Now, also, when you think about the law and the regulation around leveling the information asymmetry between insiders outside, that is focus of the law. The law tried to make the information uh, ground to be fair between insiders and outsiders, but worry less about the unleveled ground among the outsiders. Because our inside trading law focus on material non-public information obtained from a source that owes a duty of trust or confidence to the firm. So for example, if you're a CEO, if you're a brother of the CEO, you are the lawyer of the firm, you're the auditor of the firm, you owe a duty of trust and confidence to the firm. Therefore, you cannot reveal or leak those information for anyone to trade upon. So the technology raised this issue, say, what if the information has been in fact created outside the firm? How this should be interpreted and regulated? Now, what do I mean? The technology brought huge amount of cloud data about firms and the investment community called it alternative data. So whenever we don't have a name, a good um, coin name for it, we call it alternative, alternative assets, alternative investment. Now we have alternative data, right? So what are alternative data? It is incredibly broad term, but I would say Alternative data are data generated outside the firm and that tracks the footprints of the firm. Now, when I say footprints, it could mean something literal footprints, like the footprints in the parking lot. I can also mean footprints in the figurative sense. For example, the scan, um, the scan, the, the, the credit card scan, the sensors, the social media posting, the internet traffic. So they're all footprints. And they could be tracked by satellite images, and they could be tracked by supercomputing computers. Now, management might know, but increasingly, those data are getting ahead of the management knowledge. So these days, for example, the Home Depot, the Home Depot is a, is a wonderful example where uh, the, the, the thing about Home Depot is everybody, everybody drives a big truck, a big car uh, to the Home Depot parking lot and, and, and haul away the big merchandise. So the satellite that tracks the Home Depot, uh, Home Depot parking lot actually could have an estimate of the firm earnings before even the CFO of the firm would aggregate from the financial statements. An interesting thing is that the information, I would say, is both universal and uneven. Universal means if you care to know 
if you have the resources and capabilities to know, you can have access to the information. But such access is clearly uneven. So when I talk to a vendor of the alternative data, they quote me a price that my academic research funding will not be even to afford it. So that's what I call the, the access is universal, but it's very, very uneven. Now, not just about this alternative data generated outside the firm. We also have the traditional data, the SEC filings, the press releases, the CEO speeches, the investor relation presentations and audio and video and other formats. They are also dramatically changed the landscape of what we view as information or as data. Now, the Cohen Malloy Nguyen has a recent paper that show how the 10K lens has increased five times on the span of 12 years, and how the number of textual changes also increased by 12 times during the decade. Now, the SEC uh, archive uh, of filings, the Edgar, which many of us scrape day in, day out, uh, according to an estimate by the SEC itself, as, as much as 85% of document visits are actually made by internet bot. So currently the Edgar houses about 12 million filings and it's way beyond the capacity of any human reader's uh, ability to, to really, really uh, interpret and, and in, um, interpret and, and process the information. So the differenti differentiability to process the big data also creates another level of information asymmetry, despite the fact that all these data are utterly public information. Now, the SEC was set up in the early 1930s precisely to make sure that all the information will have, all everybody will have equal access to the information through the public, uh, through the company public disclosure. But when the big data involved as to today, I will say the ability, differential ability to process this information that make public information to a lot of uh, to a large degree more like private information because people have different interpretation and different timing of the processing of such public information. Now, neither the two forms of information asymmetry uh, really could be mitigated by regulations such as Red FD. You can ask companies to, to post the, the, the filings at the same time, at the first time when something happens, but it doesn't prevent the investors to really process information at different depths and a different promptness. So I really like a recent paper by Christina Zhu uh, at Wharton. Uh, so she showed that those externally generated alternative data are really changed a lot the, 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 the mechanism of corporate governance. So she showed that these external data actually are predictive of firm performance and could offset the insider advantage. So management would enjoy less rents from insider trading, which I view is, is, is a positive thing. And you can also make her point uh, broader because now we have growing data that can also provide information of ownership structures, leadership quality, you know, the Yahoo chat room reveals shareholder sentiment, also the Reddit does it too. And uh, the, the glass door is where the employees bad mouth and whine about the employers. That's another, another source of employee satisfaction. Now, if, uh, the alternative data also have been given the ESG metrics, a lot of content and the transparency, such as emission or even air quality near a factory, okay? So here, you know, I would like to uh, showcase uh, a, a interesting result for a recent paper I have with Chao Wang and Yang. So basically that show how the alternative data coverage would change the information advantage among uh, the investment banks or the analyst brokerage houses. So here we're looking at the analyst performance. You can see the performance accurate or they beat a, a preset benchmark. So the alternative data cover is a indicator variable equal to one that is after a firm such as Home Depot became covered by the alternative data vendors so that people, some a subset of investors could potentially purchase and process the data and know about the firm ahead 
and incremental to what everybody else was knowing. Okay, so post is a post coverage, and the third one, AI hiring, uh, is a variable capture how much AI talents a brokerage house is hiring, a hiring uh, based on a job posting database called Burning Glass. Now, if we just focus on the first row with a triple uh, term where the single and the double terms are all, all, uh, uh, all controlled for, is we can see that after the alternative data became available on a firm, then those brokerage houses with analysts who cover the firm uh, are feeding with the brokerage house that actually high AI talents. Somehow their forecast quality is getting ahead of everybody else. Now you can also apply this to hedge funds or other proprietary investors and you will incur, you will infer they are getting an edge in the private, uh, not the private, in the public information, but they are having, enjoying the information asymmetry. Now, the machines are a big part of it because when you have alternative data like internet, uh, internet traffic or credit card scan or satellite image, it's not something that a human being or even with the regular programming or computer computation can handle. You need to involve machine learning or some AI technique. So in a related paper, we are actually tracking to what extent the machines or machine learning investors are actually entering the market space. So this is a uh, chart that's showing the percentage or the absolute number of FCC downloads that are conducted by machines using uh, an algorithm uh, developed in the previous uh, literature. Basically say if it's an IP address, uh, conduct a batch downloading with the volume clearly ex uh, exceeds the human capacity, then we will classify this as a machine downloads. So in the recent years, in the late 2010s, you will see that between 80 and 90% of the SEC downloads are actually made by the machine. Now, we would also argue that if materials are downloaded by my machine, we just don't feel that it is um, human beings are analyzing it just by sheer volume of the batch. So these are, are, are telling us that increasingly there are more and more machines are downloading reports and then analyze on machine. So companies are making changes accommodating such a trend. So in the right chart, we are showing that companies are making their filings more machine readable. Now, what is machine readability? Now, if you ever program in Python or in R, that any time the, the formatting, the filing formatting will make your codes running faster, more accurately, that's pretty much linked to the machine readability. Now, including the separate of the text and the, the tables or the isolation of a number in a particular table cell, et cetera. So you can also see that the companies are making their filing to be more straightforward for the machine to process, to parse, so that the information could get into the investors in a timely and accurate manner. Okay. Now, how would this affect, really affect information asymmetry? So here uh, I'm talking about a new problem, uh, not, if not completely new, certainly a, a, a increasingly uh, um, um, uh, increasingly significant problem. Because before when we think about information asymmetry is always it's private information. But here we are talking about public information asymmetry. Now, what is this analysis? In this analysis, my co-authors and I are tracking the number of seconds leading to the first trade after SEC filing is deposited, okay? Now in the last four columns, we're tracking a number of seconds are leading to the first directional trade. The first directional trade will be the first profitable trade based on the pricing 15 minutes after the filing, presumably when all the information is properly uh, interpreted and incorporated. So what we find here is that the higher the machine downloads chasing after the company, the quicker it takes for the first trade to occur and even quicker 
for the first profitable trade, the first directional trade to occur after their filing is deposited. Now, when we interact it with machine readability, it's also significant. What does it mean? Meaning when the firms make the filings more machine readable, uh, you're giving steroids on the machine for them to run even faster. Okay, so what does it, what is implication for the vast majority of, of say the, the, the common uh, investors? I would say this is actually a deterioration of information asymmetry, as we also show that the bid ask spread during the 15 minutes right after, uh, right after the filing uh, is increasing with the number of machine downloads. So the market makers or the market in general is taking into account that the superpowered machines are getting information advantage despite the source of information is actually public. Okay. Now, this game does not end here because then there's another level of feedback. If, we, if the firms know that the machines are listening, then the firms would also have the incentive to change the way they talk, right? Because any agents with a vested interest would have the incentive to try to manipulate their new audience. So this is not a new issue. I dig out this article from the Institutional Investor Magazine um, six years ago, right? So basically say, if you saw through language in the transcript of earnings call, other, 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 um, other disclosure looking for tones or positive negative words, then once BlackRock is successful decoding such reports, the management of those companies is gonna catch on and attempt to change the signal they're advertently, advertently sending. Now, this was at the age when we were using um, just regular computer coded algorithm for text analysis, but imagine how today they will change when we have better technology at hand for natural language processing kits. Now, let me just show an old story. So let's say the seminal paper by Lockheed McDonald is 2011. So that paper developed a dictionary that determines certain words representing negative sentiment, right? And how would this change about this frequency of these words? So here are finding. So 2011 is also an interesting time. I think it's also coincided with emergence of, of, of the sophisticated uh, machine learning based algorithmic trading. So you will see when we group firms uh, in the top tercile machine downloads versus the bottom tercile machine downloads and their frequency of using Locker McDonald's negative words. Up to 2011, they were neck to neck. But after 2011, the publication of the paper, you will see that firms with top machine downloads would significantly reduce the use of such negative words, while the firms with little machine downloads don't seem to care that much. Okay, so this would show how the boost the information generate outside the firm, as well as the large volume of the big data generate inside the firm have quite changed the concept of asymmetric information that is very, very central for corporate governance. Okay. So now let me get to the second pillar, which concerns the new foundational technology for ownership and voting. And this is essentially about how are we supposed to know what the shareholders' preferences are and how do we aggregate them and then represent them. Now this one, we can draw some lessons from the early civilization of Western democracy. About 300 to 500 years BC, the city state of Athens had the system which was direct democracy, which means citizens vote directly on the important policies of the state nation. And it's analogy to the modern corporate governance would be shareholders make direct decision, uh, shareholders exercise almost direct decision-making on corporation matters. So for example, shareholders can submit 
proposals and shareholders can vote say on pay. And after all, when there's a control change, usually the direct shareholder votings are required. Now to the right panel, this is about three to 500 later, we had Roman Republic, which is the earliest form of representative democracy when the citizens will elect their magistrates that analogous to today's congressmen and senators who will in turn make decisions for the country or at the government. Okay, now the modern analogy, the corporate governance analogy will be proxy context. So the shareholders would elect their, the directors who represent them uh, in, on the board and the board will in turn making important decisions. Now, the overall trend in the past two decades is that we are having more and more direct democracy. But by and large, we are still in the representative democracy in terms of corporate governance. We are still having a board centric model. Even if shareholders want eventually be the key decision maker for the companies, usually they will have to go through first a proxy context meaning a contested election of the board members before they can exercise their preferences. So how the technology will change this? The technology must change because we have observed major, major blunders in the voting plumbing in which shareholder preferences were notably mis or erroneously represented. So I will here highlight two famous cases. One is T. Rowe Price, a uh, large asset manager that runs a lot of mutual funds as well as separate accounts. So T. Rowe Price tried to dissent against Dell going private transaction in 2018. So Michael Dell, the founding CEO of Dell Computer took the company private in 2013 and it was regarded by many people that Michael Dell and the Silver Lake, the private equity firm that they are, the, the management team worked with, were underpaying, were squeezing out the outside shareholders who had little pay, a little power. Now, in fact, in the shareholder votes, nearly 30% of the shareholders vote against the deal. And if you know about any takeover deal, a 30% dissension is considered to be very, very large. Now, if the shareholders refused for their shares to be squeezed out, if they are dissenters to the end, not only they could refrain from voting, they could also surrender their shares to a court for a judicially determined fair value. And that is called appraisal. Now, here's the trick. The t -Row price, t -Row thought it dissented. Hence, it had the right to receive the higher appraisal value from the judge. But in the end, people discovered that T. Rowe Price actually voted for the deal, hence lost the right to receive the appraisal price. Not only that, at one time it had to compensate its shareholders because it misrepresented the shareholders' preference. Now, another interesting story in the same time, uh, in the same year, is with Dole Foods. Again, the CEO of Dole Foods was also alleged to, uh, to be engaged in some um, uh, dubious behavior that underpaid its shareholders using empty voting. So the CEO entered a settlement in a class action lawsuit to compensate the shareholders for the underpayment in the management MBO, the management buyout. Now, you would think the outside shareholders should hold less than 100% because a significant proportion of the shares were actually held by the insiders, including the CEOs. But guess what? 134% of the shares outstanding showed up and claimed to be eligible for such compensation. Okay. So Smith in 2013 had a very, very nice paper called Overvoting, basically say, uh, when I own a share with Morgan Stanley, so Morgan Stanley probably doesn't know whether I voted share. Morgan Stanley thought they voted for me and I actually voted for myself. So that would lead to overvoting. But most of the time, uh, when not everybody show up for voting, so if 92% people show up voting, nobody thinks it's a problem. But every once in a while, 
100, more than 100% of people will show up voting. And overvoting actually introduced a pro-management bias. That's what that, that paper is about. Now, how do you deal with this? Uh, how would you, why is this, this, this a, a serious issue? It is a serious issue because in contested, close contested elections, we actually do not know who win, who actually win under the current system. Now, many people say the same thing about the presidential elections in the US. For many, many, many times, the notable, especially the 2000 election between Al Gore and, 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 and George W. Bush, probably even to today, we don't know who actually won, but of course, President Bush declared to be the winner. But the same analogy happened in the proxy context. So another paper I wrote with uh, Brad Lee and Pennington, uh, we show that proxy contacts are incredibly pivotal and incredibly close. Now, conditional on a contested board election actually go to the voting stage. Dissidents won 49%, 49.5% time. That's literally a statistical half. Now, also on those proxy fights, the leading proxy advisors, such as the ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services, they recommend supporting the dissident for 52% of the time. That's another number that's very arbitrary close to half, meaning conditional on a contested election. Really, both sides stand roughly the equal chance of winning. Now, we have seen quite a few uh, close contacts, probably the closest record will go to trying versus Prop and Gamble in 2017. Because the results, initially, the PNG announced winning by 0.2%. And there was a recount. And the trying declared they won by 16 basis, uh, by actually 0.16 basis points, not even 0.16 basis points. And later, PNG wanted a recount and try won the recount. And in the end, nobody admit right or wrong, but the trying representatives were set on the board. Okay. So the SEC, even in 2018, as near as close as 2018, admitted that if the context is closer than 55 to 45, there is no verifiable answer to the question who won. That is actually staggering when you think about this level of inaccuracy in our modern corporate governance system. Now, why is that? The thing that we call it proxy plumbing, it literally looks like a plumbing system that is a labyrinth of pipes that we don't know where it goes to where. Now, we all think we own our stocks except in old days, we own a paper certificate and nobody can eat the cake and have it. You cannot transfer the, the stock and still have the certificate. But in modern time, all our stock holdings are nothing but electronic symbols and deposit around and under different accounts. So you think about if you trace down this chart, this plumbing, eventually all our stocks are deposit with DTC, Depository Trust Company. And when we want to vote our shares in a certain way, then the order will go the reverse order and you have no idea when the order will be lost, instruction will be lost, or information will be lost in translation. So this is the current system, but how can technology save us? Now, when you think about what is so wonderful about blockchain, why blockchain suddenly turn, uh, blockchain suddenly becomes so popular in the payment system. So when I say blockchain, you don't have to equate this to, to Bitcoin or any coin. You know, the, the, crypto, the cryptocurrency is just the one application built on the blockchain, but blockchain is a far more fundamental technology that could be used in the finance and system as a market in many, many different ways. Now, when I think about a blockchain, a defining, a defining feature as well as the most important merit of the blockchain as it resolves the double voting issue, right? And any system can resolve the double voting regardless of where you deposit the coin or regardless where you deposit the shares should also be the solution to double voting. 
So anytime, if you, if you have a system to solve double spending, you actually have a system to resolve double voting. So Yermak had a 2017 BMO paper that promotes the blockchain as the future for the transparency, accuracy, and immutability of ownership, which I completely agree. Now, not only the blockchain uh, is hopeful of solving the undervoting and double voting overview issue, it could also allow us to add additional features to our shareholding. So for example, now in the US, there's a new stock exchange called the Long-Term Stock Exchange, LTSE. So what is long-term stock exchange? Long-term stock exchange will promote, will allow companies to issue shares. Then one additional year the shareholders holds it, you get one more vote. So the first year you hold a share, you have one vote. Second year, you have two votes. Up to 10 years, you have 10 votes and be capped there. Now, such a system would encourage shareholders to be long-term holders and you reward the long-term holders with more decision power because they have been with the firm for the longer time. Now, the current long-term stock exchange is an escrow account. Basically, you have to deposit your shares. With that account, you cannot retrieve it for selling to sell it or even to lend for short selling. But it's a very, very cumbersome system which restricts the scale. But if we move to the blockchain and then the tenure counting will be a more straightforward and transparent way. Now you can also issue different classes of shares sort of different level of privacy, or you can have a sunset of due class shares contingent on firm performance. For example, if three years contiguous years for the stock returns um, from lagging its peers by a certain amount, then you could have the due class set, uh, due class share system uh, to sunset. Now, recently, I also talked to uh, some entrepreneurs. They are setting up a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. They're setting up a platforms uh, for individual shareholders to change, to trade their shares into coins and then delegate the platform to vote their proxies with a preset preferences. So this is essentially serve as a self-sufficient uh, proxy advisors, but not rely on the ISS, but rely on the DAO. And that could be a very, very uh, a promising future for the retail shareholders to aggregate as well as concentrate their voting power. So retail shareholders still hold you know, close to half of the shares in small cap companies, and to all the way about 20 to 25% for the large cap. They could be powerful, except they're, they're not, because there's not a simple way to aggregate their preferences as well as to exercise their voting rights, okay? So uh, for a company uh, that's listed on, 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 on a public or permissioned blockchains, uh, we can think about many, many interesting uh, features into the, the ownership transparency uh, because the blockchain, it's not just people think about the blockchain is anonymous. I would think it's pseudonymous rather than anonymous because even with the most decentralized technologies, suppose you're completely anonymous with arbitrary number of digital wallet uh, per investor, uh, you can think about identity could still be traced to the level as accomplished by today, as the tape watchers who are, still, uh, who are just constantly staring at order flow can still figure out uh, where the informed tradings are going. Okay, so the, the regulators have could have new tools such as re requiring the public keys of insiders under the penalty of law or acquire a, require a type code for certain disclosures, such as once you crossing the 5% uh, uh, threshold that triggers the current schedule certain D, but could trigger a different type code in the blockchain technology, okay? So I found that these two uh, stories to be uh, very interesting. Uh, one is from Heron Lear, uh, which shows that, you know, uh, this is day zero is when the CEOs were um, uh, granted option grant. You know, suddenly they miraculously know that this is the lowest uh, lowest price date and they were granted the option and then you have the, the st stock appreciation. Now the right panel is the Yamak 2009 paper, which shows 
The highest point is when a CEO actually donate the stock for charity. So it's counted at the highest level. Now those records, I think in, in the blockchain state will be over because of blockchain precisely, you cannot rewrite the history. You will have this immutability and that will wipe out such interesting stories. So I would think these kind of stories will only belong uh, to the history of corporate governance because they were not afforded with a technology that absolutely influenced immutability. Okay, so now let me go to the last question. From the decision making to execution, how the technology will expand the new contracting space and how it would affect uh, the board's executory, uh, uh, ex execution power. Now, central to this issue are smart contracts. Here I'm quoting a recent paper by Chong and her. And what are smart contracts? So smart contracts have this uh, underlying, uh, underlined uh, features, they're digital contracts, they're term contingent, and they're decentralized based on decentralized consensus, they're temper proof, they're self-enforcing and have automatic execution, okay? So despite the fact that smart contracts are called smart, there's no intelligence to it. It's actually more robotic than intelligence. Now, admittedly, we always have a lot of quasi smart contracts. You can think about a vending machine or a smart contract or an escrow account a smart contract because there's no intelligence. All about, all it is about is a very, very temper free uh, automatic execution. Okay. So smart contracts has already been used to collateral property rights, insurance. Now these days, whenever you know your landlord or, or your real estate agent sends you a docu sign, you know you're actually entering a smart contract. Now, why does this why does this matter? So the smart contract introduces in the big data age introduces a couple of very interesting interesting uh, uh, features. One is that in the old days, when we think about moral hazard, it's a problem of hidden action, right? But in a very nice paper recently by Chong, He, and Li, in their paper, it's about blockchain mining. In the blockchain mining, efforts is actually effectively observable because you, it's the frequency you solve a lower scale math problem, even though if you don't win the ultimate prize. But the moral hazard actually come from the other issues in the mining, okay? Now, we also think that smart contracts are wonderful because it could uh, save, um, uh, it, it could prevent strategic behavior. It could remove need to, for the trust. But let's think about, it. suppose we have smart contract. Can we have an autopiloting board just making the principles of decision and don't need to make a decision and don't have to worry about execution? Now, I would think it depends. There are two extreme cases which I highlight here. One is that the smart contract is particularly suited in situations when commitment is better than renegotiation, right? So think about real estate foreclosure. A lot of buyers, even though they are able to pay, they will not pay. That's called strategic default. Strategic default exists because they know the human counterpart will be very tempted to renegotiate instead of foreclose on them, which will lead to a worse outcome for both. But if you have a smart contract of automatic execution that you would deter such uh, strategic behavior, which is not possible for any human being to commit because such a commitment technology does not exist. Now, on the other hand, for the smart contract to work, contingency must be free from any feedback effect. So here's a case that similar cases would require or is much better off with human decision making in a case of war or something similar. Now, Sandra Rice and Wang, 2015, uh, used this model in a cocoa bond trigger. So cocoa bonds are, are basically the bonds that automatically or, or semi-automatically become equity or become written off when a bank is in distress. So this is a bail-in instead of bail-out. So for the bank in distress, if some of the debt is automatically written off, convert to equity, then it doesn't need to be bailed off or by the government. Now, the problem is that if you have a mechanical triggering of the cocoa bonds, 
then the cocoa bonds will be triggered because this uh, convertible bonds are feeding on this anticipation would automatically trade in such a way the what that would uh, uh, drop that would decrease the price of equity to be crossing the triggering line. So in this case, if you put a human decision maker into the position, you can actually avoid such called a death spiral. So both these two cases, I would try to um, uh, express that, you know, I don't think we're entering the age of autopiloting board, which some, you know, some uh, technology um, research has been advocating, especially for engineers, because in the real world, we have both situations. In some situations, commitment is better than renegotiation, while in some other situations, automatic decision making actually would lead to, lead to a self-fulfilling equilibrium or even in the worst case of a death spiral. So the good news is that human directors will still have uh, their, uh, their, their, their position in, in the corporate governance. Okay, so uh, my 40 minutes are up, so I just have time to, uh, to conclude. So it is a incredibly uh, rich field. I'm just so fascinated by the field. You know, I just want to learn more about it, learn more from you as well, because I think the data technology has been fundamentally reshaping our financial markets and in corporate governance as well. But the the technology and corporate governance are not the direct pair that people usually think about. They think about trading, they think about stock analysis, but not quite corporate governance. Now, technology will solve some problem, will create a problem, but will always face a new level of capacity and efficiency. Now, the, the final conclusion, the central, con uh, the central conclusion is that our board-centric model needs to adapt to the new information the preference aggregation and the contractual feasibility. So I really look forward to seeing more research uh, in this conference as well as in our profession. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wei, for such a comprehensive and also very interesting keynote talk. Um, for the audience, please feel free to type the questions in the chat box um, if you have any questions. Um, I, I will start with one because I really okay, find this area yes. very, fasc uh, very fascinating and it's definitely growing. So where do you see the challenges that are arising from the fact that there is just more data out there and the general public doesn't necessarily have access to this information? They were already a little bit lagging when it came to financial market participation because there's fast traders with fast access to information. Now they are kind of face, uh, facing a different challenge, which is the one that they don't even have the availability of this type of more accurate data that is a, that has become available through the um, through the AI and big data opportunities. So I actually think um, um, you know, uh, Alvira, this is precisely there's a there's a gigantic resentment and frustration uh, mm -hmm. among the small shareholders, you know, the, 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 the Robin Hood uprising, the, the mean stocks, that's precisely, it's kind of a battle that uh, the retail shareholder try to wage against institutional shareholders, right? So, mm -hmm. And, and I, my view that they actually, the, the, the retail shareholders won some battle, but I don't think they will win the war. I think <laughs> in, in the mm -hmm. longer run, the, the information, the, the information advantage will go dramatically. Like we have, it, what is what I call is called an equal rights differential power. But everybody have equal rights. You know, if you want to know, you can know. If you want to buy the data, buy the data. It's not like data vendor discriminate against anyone, not selling to anyone who's who's a willing payer. So everybody has equal rights, but we have very very differential power. So I think you know, in fact, I would think there should be there should be more delegation to professional managers. Right, the more passive, more more passive managed. So, so people like me, I should just delegate, you know, to to the index funds, the passive management, or you hold a stock for for twenty years for for long term, for the longer term, then this information um, advantage is not very important. But I, I can also see, you know, most people don't agree with me. They actually want want to stage their battle against the big people, and occasionally they win some battles. So that's that's what actually what we observe. So do you think, um, how do you think this affects the, royal, or the role of noise traders? Because obviously with, 
now we have no before noise traders were uninformed now they're even less like the information gap has grown wider yeah. Um, yeah. but maybe they are a smaller section of the population so um how do we think we can quantify these sort of uh, changes both in the fact that yeah. there is a larger institutional holding yeah. in stocks but yeah. also yeah. the information gap between institutions and noise traders has become much wider yeah so you know that's a very very uh, uh, uh interesting question so actually i have a, a unfinished but in, in the process of writing paper, you know, the title is called a coordinated noise. So, you know, noise trader doesn't impact anything, right? In, in the mm. classic uh, microstructure model, the noise trader just, just adding liquidity uh, to the market. But these days, because the noise traders also receive certain common signal precisely because of technology, right? because of social mm. media, because of information aggregator. So they're getting certain common signal that leads to them to react or act in certain ways. So even though the noise trader, the signal might be noise, but they're also noisy in the same direction that will lead to a large sway of order imbalance in one direction or the other. So this is why uh, in the last two years, we actually saw how noise traders would dramatically impact the stock price, especially when the stock's in high um, um, short selling, outstanding, or, 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 or relatively thin trading model. So this is mm -hmm. what we will continue to see because the technology also uh, produce uh, common signals, noisy or informative, that's instantly access to many. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the audience? You can raise your hands. Uh, okay. So there are a few coming through the questions. So are rating agencies doing enough to accurately reflect data points? Can technology improve the work that rating agencies are doing, especially in relation to debt? Absolutely. So I think, you know, rating agencies definitely have the feeds from very, very uh, current and advanced data. So I think, you know, it, I, I, it's my impression is not rating agency at the very, very cutting edge of processing big data, alternative data. But what I know is that a lot of them are getting into this technology and try to incorporate those externally, externally generated data in their assessment of firm potential distress, absolutely. Uh, and Young Ting Tu asks, technology investment could help individual investors collectively and directly voice their preferences. Do you think this is good or bad for corporate governance uh, or in general for firm value creation? So in general, I, I believe, you know, all shareholders are created equal, right? So, so if you invest one dollar, if I invest one dollar, my dollar should have, you know, the same voice as BlackRock's dollar. Of course, BlackRock may be a trillion dollar, but that's a different matter. That's already weighted in. So, I think uh, historically, the the retail shareholders' voices are very low, and you know, most of them don't even show up in voting because uh, there is no platform that. Uh, that either uh, collect their preference or even uh, cast a vote for them. So I think right now uh, people do realize that this is a big chunk, right? Because if you think about in a typical mid middle middle cap stock, the 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 retail shareholders own somewhere between one quarter to one half. So you know BlackRock might own uh, um, five to ten, and and usually the the big three own twenty. So basically. The retail shareholders combined uh, 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 have, a, have a very, very uh, large scale that could counter uh, the large institution, not counter, but also on par with the with a few, say, large largest institutional investors. So there's no reason to think that their voice should, uh, should matter less. And if companies are worried that they don't want um, like investors, you know, come in and out and just, just, just just spare noise or just have a very short term horizon, then I think they can go for uh, a priori setting up a rule for tenure based voting or something like that. But it should not be uh, treated differentially as who the shareholder is. Thank you. Um, so, a further question from actually the first uh, 
query Jess Yogaratna. So the advent of technology also invites cybersecurity issues. This has the potential of manipulating data. What checks and balances need to be considered? Yeah, so you know, I think the, the data on corporate governance, I would think there are a couple of issues um, I left out. So, so today I'm talking about how data affects corporate governance, but I really didn't talk about the governance of data per se, right? So I think this issue actually concerns the governance of data. How do firms, you know, to, to, to regular data so it's not hacked, it doesn't compromise the, the privacy of the, the subjects of these data. So I think uh, this is an even newer topic. So when we talk mm -hmm. about corporate governance, we should also talk about data governance, that is the governance of data. So I, I, I really, really welcome to see new research on that even newer topic. Thank you. And Terry Pan has a question on the heterogeneity of the power of technology and data. So what he's asking is, will technology have different power in markets with different ownership structures? For instance, uh, China is a highly concentrated ownership type market. Will the functions of this big data con concerns and opportunities kind of differ across different corporate, corporate governance environments and also ownership structures? You know, you know, absolutely. So I think in, in a market like China, um, on the one hand, you know, the, the ownership structure is very, very concentrated that the, the state and all the government as well, the agency of the government own a large number of shares. But on the other hand, uh, they are not the active traders. They don't, they don't actively just set the price by, by, by trading those shares active in the market. So the active traders on those markets have more price setting power than actually state owned shares. I'm just saying in based on the fundamental in the, in the price setting um, per se. And China's actually also, it's really, really um, um, uh, in the front wave of the external generated data. Because from what I know is that China is the only place where you have very well developed a blockchain even for supply chains uh, for supply chains so basically people can actually observe supply chain information from certain public or permission blockchain and uh, uh, certain people can establish a supply chain um, by removing the, the need for the trust which is precisely what the blockchain is for so in terms of all the things china's actually currently ahead uh, of most of the other countries, it's in, in the front wave of, of this technology development. Now, to what extent for such information to be reflected in the financial market, I, I don't think that part is currently at the front wave of, of, of the world because the, the financial, financial system is not, is not quite uh, a, a, as free as, as, as one would wish. So I think there's a, a little bit disconnect uh, between the, the, the technology part and the financial system part. But I think in certain part, China is actually um, very, very advanced right now. And we have a question from Timothy Peters in relation to DAOs. So you referred to DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. And his question is, do you see a significant development of disaggregation of the board function in the near term? Is this likely to increase or decrease a focus on shareholder value over, for example, things like environmental concerns or social issues? So, you know, I, I think my general view is that uh, the, there's, there's no fundamental uh, conflict between what shareholders want and what is good for society. Because, you know, shareholders are human beings and, and, and live on this planet. And if the planet uh, goes bust, you know, shareholders, it, it's not good for shareholders. So I think shareholders in the end understand uh, 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 all these issues. So in fact, this this, this one company I mentioned that uh, that I, you know, I've been talking to, I find it's pretty amazing is that they are actually registering retail shareholders for their overall preference, not just preference for high earnings, for high profits, but also to elicit their preferences for say, uh, board diversity or the, the, the pollution abatement or the carbon footprint. They are registering these shareholder preferences. So when the voting come, there will be an auto execution of the proxy votes, not just for the, the regular business or financial issues, but also for these broad societal issues. 
Um, I don't see any further questions and we're almost on time. So thank you, Wei, for an extremely informative and actually very broad-based talk. I think everybody enjoyed it. And thank you for fielding all these questions left, right, and center. <laughs> it was great to have you here. Great have question. a great yeah. evening. And I'll hand it over to Philip to carry on with the rest okay. of the conference program. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for the organizers. My honor, my pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Thank you, Wei. Thank you, Alvira. Um, we might call this session to a close. There's a 15 minute break before the concurrent sessions start. So um, everyone can have a quick break before we get into the, the concurrent sessions. Thank you both. <laughs>